And welcome to Making a Difference, a constructive journalism program. Today we look forward to bringing you stories covering a diverse range of issues and ideas, and always with a focus on solutions to problems. I'm Zoe Stinson. And I'm Gabriella Kaylee Sumampau. Each story on the program today was produced by a student journalist using new technology and innovative techniques to report on the issues that matter to you. We're coming to you live from a fully remote studio run by a talented student tech crew. Later in the program, we'll discuss the concept of good journalism during our Kojo 2020 debate. But first, today's news headlines with Dom Hennequin and Yusuf Saudi. Thanks, Zoe. Today was Victoria's second day of eased restrictions. Victoria recorded three new coronavirus cases and zero deaths. Retail, cafes, bars and restaurants are now open for people to visit. And people from more than two households are able to meet outdoors. Premier Daniel Andrews says we need to stay vigilant and that international borders may open later this year. We need to do this properly and we will. Uh, and we need to look at what's in that report. But as soon as we can safely uh, have that system set up and have those flights returning, we will, and I'm very confident we'll be able to have that well before Christmas. Uh, but I think it's, prob Lundy, it's probably uh, toward the end of November rather than the middle, I would, I would think. Rights groups have called for Qatar to stop criminalising sex outside marriage. They're also calling to end its aggressive enforcement over what are sometimes called love crimes. The call to stop the criminalisation of sex outside marriage was sparked after Qatar Airways forced women on a number of flights to go through invasive medical examinations. One of the strongest typhoons in two decades, Typhoon Molave, has hit the Vietnamese coast. Typhoon has left two people dead and dozens missing. At least 40,000 people have been evacuated to emergency shelters. France and Germany will re-enter national lockdowns after a surge in COVID-19 cases. Germany was praised for keeping infection and death rates low earlier this year. It is now struggling to contain a second wave. In France, schools rem will remain open, but restaurants and retail will be closed from next Friday. Germany will impose similar measures next Monday as Europe continues to grapple with rising case numbers. The Victorian government says it expects crowds of 25,000 people will be able to attend the Boxing Day test this year. The Melbourne Cricket Ground confirmed it will host the test between India and Australia on Tuesday. Crowd capacity will be confirmed closer to the event. The Indian team is due to arrive in Sydney on the 12th of November and will quarantine at Sydney's Olympic Park for two weeks where they can also train. And now to the weather. Today in Melbourne is mostly sunny with a top of 23 degrees. In Sydney, light showers today and a cooler 18 degrees. Adelaide sees showers too and a top of 20 degrees. Severe storm warnings remain in place for southeast Queensland after torrential rain caused flash flooding in Brisbane yesterday. And those are the latest news headlines. It's back to you, Zoe and Gabby. Thank you, Dom and Yusuf, for those updates. Now to our first story. Women and children in regional and remote areas are more likely to experience domestic violence than those living in the city. But a new initiative is helping these women stay safer in their homes. Alexandra Middleton reports. 
Diana Connor would have stayed in her own home if she had the option to. But after experiencing 20 years of emotional, financial and physical abuse at the hands of her partner, she and her son had no choice but to leave their home. You shouldn't have your whole life uprooted when you're the victim. Living on a farm in rural Victoria meant Diana was isolated from the services available to victims of family violence, including the nearest women's refuge, which was over two hours away. It's not like we could just all of a sudden just up and leave two hours away. CEO of Annie North Women's Refuge, Julie Oberon, says there are just over 20 women's refuges across Victoria, with the majority located in metropolitan areas or major regional centres. It's not just a lack of women's refuge response, but it's a lack of services in general. It's been removing the women and kids and they end up invariably disadvantaged or in the homelessness system because they've been uprooted and it doesn't do anybody any good. Domestic Violence Victoria's policy manager, Alison Birchall, says making it safe for victim survivors to remain in their homes is at the forefront of the nation's plan to tackle the family violence crisis. What we would like to do is actually remove perpetrators from those situations. The federal government's Keeping Women Safe in Their Homes program, which was established the same year as Australia's first Royal Commission into Family Violence, aims to help women and children who have experienced abuse to remain in their homes, when it's safe to do so, by providing them with increased security and resources. It really supports the whole sort of safe at home um, approach to family violence where the people that are the source of the risk are the ones that are removed rather than the victims. The Australian government has already committed $34.5 million to the Keeping Women Safe in Their Homes initiative. In the coming years, they will allocate a further $18 million to state and territory governments and domestic violence service providers to support them in supporting victim survivors. This means support services like Annie North Women's Refuge have increased resources to help victim survivors stay safe at home and recover from the trauma they have experienced. Knowing that if we could have stayed in our own home, it just would have been so much easier for us. Alexandra Middleton reporting for RMIT. We'll now take a short break, but don't go anywhere. Coming up, we'll hear stories about young people's mental health during the pandemic and dive into the effects of cancel culture. And we'll look at how we can navigate social media safely. You can follow us on Twitter at Junction Journos and Instagram at Junction Journalism. All the details should be on the screen below. We're now heading to a short break. You're watching Kojo 2020.
Welcome back to Kojo 2020, a constructive journalism project brought to you by student journalists dedicated to producing informative, diverse stories from Australia and beyond. I'm Zoe Stinson. And I'm Gabriella Kaylee Sumampau. The live music industry has suffered in Melbourne as lockdown restrictions keep audiences out of venues. To get by, a Melbourne-based violinist has found comfort in nature. Zoe Stinson has the story. Phoebe Maisel is a violinist with the Australian National Academy of Music, but lockdowns in Melbourne mean she's been unable to perform for months. While her first love is on hold, she has found a new passion, bird watching. So I haven't been able to perform all year, obviously due to the lockdowns and the restrictions on gatherings. So, you know, walking in nature has been such an important part of my day. It really motivates me to get up in the morning and it's always the highlight of the day. There's always something new to see that day that you haven't seen before. Phoebe walks every day on the local Merry Creek Trail, looking out for native wildlife. She paints the bird species she sees for her Instagram, another creative project she's using to get through lockdown. So my passion project is sort of a goal that I set myself to make a watercolour painting of every bird species that I've seen. So I created an Instagram page called Phoebe and the Flock just as a way of keeping track of all of those paintings and just to keep me accountable and just share what I'm passionate about. Walking and bird watching are a hobby for Phoebe, but getting out in nature could also have a positive impact on her well-being. Us humans are part of nature and uh, we have been deeply connected to nature for all of the time we've been on this planet. Apart from very recent times, we've moved inside and on a screen. And so when we're out in nature, our stress levels are reduced. Our ability to switch on our senses is increased and we're very sensory beings. So that just makes us feel good just in that moment. And nature also has a positive impact on every system within our body. Until recently, Melburnians were limited to walking within five kilometres of their home. But ease restrictions mean they can now exercise up to 25 kilometres away, opening new destinations for Phoebe. Zoe Stinson, reporting for Kojo 2020. Joining me now to discuss youth mental health during the pandemic is positive psychology practitioner, Lisa Barker. Lisa, thank you for joining me. The thank organization you, Zoe. Great to be here. says young people have a wellbeing rate that is below average. Why is it that young people are so affected? Well, Zoe, the, the age group of 18 to 25 is already a pretty precarious time in life. Um, when it comes to mental health and you know you're in a period of real transition and you're right at the threshold of adult life there and um, to throw a pandemic into the mix just makes it that much more complex for young people uh, the smiling mind research you mentioned was really important that was done in september and 18 to 25 year olds reported that um, on a scale of one to 10, their general well-being was around 5.8, which was considerably lower than other age brackets. And they also reported higher stress, higher anxiety, higher depression. And young people in rural areas, their results were higher again. Um, and they also reported that they didn't really know where to go when they needed uh, mental health support. But the good news is there is a lot of support out there. And Lisa, everybody has had to adapt to changes in lifestyle brought on by the pandemic. How can young people improve their well-being, especially under these circumstances? Well, in Australia, Zoe, we are so lucky because there are amazing government supported resources uh, for young people, for all people, actually. But, you know, Smiling Mind is a good example. They're a mindfulness provider, but then there are many, many others that are government supported. So this means that they're free or they're subsidised. So Head to Health is another one. Headspace is another one. Beyond Blue, of course, many people know about Black Dog Institute. And the amazing thing about all of these organisations is they are staffed 
by professional, passionate people who really care about young people's well-being. And they also combine mainstream psychology support and positive psychology, which is the science of well-being, you know, the science of how we thrive. And um, so, so that would be my first go-to for young people. But then, of course, nature is another huge source of well-being. Um, it, it impacts our well-being on so many levels, physically, socially, emotionally, and most important, psycho psychologically. It really has a very positive impact on us. We feel less stressed in nature and we actually can think more creatively and we just feel more connected when we are outside. Lisa, thank you for your time. It was Thanks, Lisa. Here's two words you've likely heard a lot lately. Cancel culture. Some say it's a necessary element of progressive culture, but what happens when you dig a little deeper? Lydia Manchi has the story. Growing cancel culture. It's called cancel culture. In an instant, you can be canceled. To a new front in the culture wars. Lots of other folks are getting called out for their past actions. Cancel culture has become a big part of social media in recent years. It has changed the way we interact online, as well as the way in which we respond to social issues. But is it good or bad? And can you truly cancel someone? People use the term cancel culture to suit their own agenda and mm -hmm. we we just wanted to try and broaden out our scope. Zoe and Kirsten have a new show coming out on ABC called Reputation Rehab, in which they talk to people who were canceled. Everything on the spectrum here from Twitter pylons to mainstream media pylons to paparazzi pylons to tabloid coverage, all has an element of dehumanizing the, the people that at the center of them. Throughout the show, Zoe and Kirsten ask themselves one question. Does the punishment fit the crime? So we've kind of tried to take it back to basics in a way. Like what, what was the outrage? Like what, what is that media storm or the Twitter storm or however it manifested? And then how did that person actually feel about it? It has become common practice to cancel someone whose beliefs don't align with your own. Celebrities and non-celebrities alike have found themselves being targeted online for anything from a 10-year-old tweet to criminal allegations. Cancellation has become a universal method of informal punishment, as well as expression of political alignment. However, with the frequency in which it occurs, the motivations for cancellation have become increasingly uncertain. I just think that that becomes very dangerous when um, we write, write people off altogether without because I don't think that necessarily lends itself to conversation and change. We need to use it with caution. We can't just be throwing it around as something that is then actually creating more, more division and more polarization in our society. Cancel culture is not always bad. However, there needs to be more caution going forward as to why we are canceling someone and if it's justified. Ask yourselves, does the punishment fit the crime? I'm Lydia Manshi reporting for Kojo 2020. A reminder that you can follow us on Twitter at Junction Journals and Instagram at Junction Journalism. All the details should be on the screen below. Find us for some great behind the scenes content and a chance to get to know our passionate reporters. We're now heading into a short break. Coming up, we'll hear from a supermarket worker who has seen it all through the pandemic. We'll feature an attempt to take democracy online and look at the, look at the NGO stepping up to help those in need. Stay with us.
back to the program. I'm Zoe Stidson and you're watching Code T. Next story. Research from the University of Cambridge has found global dissatisfaction with democracy to be at its highest level in 20, in 20 years, in 25 years. Sorry. To protect the future of democracy, activists are pushing for technology to become part of the solution. Here's reporter Kira Wright. Democracy is in crisis, with satisfaction levels at their lowest point since the 1990s. However, experts in the field suggest that technology could be used as a tool to reimagine an electronic base or e-democracy. Ben West, head of e-democracy at Othello, says that building an e-democracy is about more than just moving existing systems online. Attempts to sort of put democracy online was just about moving our existing system, you know, out of a ballot box and onto the internet. Um, you know, that's really not going to solve all of our problems. Uh, to me, really, what we're trying to accomplish is to empower more people, to put more of the decision making around significant, important decisions directly in the hands of regular people. Efforts to move towards a digital democracy are already underway around the world. In Estonia, citizens can access 99% of government services, such as voting, online. Florian Marcus is the Digital Transformation Advisor at eEstonia. Although Marcus believes technology can help create a more accessible and streamlined form of democracy, it also poses some challenges. Technology overall will influence society both in a positive and in a negative way. We also have to be honest, though, that digitalization will not be the silver bullet for all your problems just because the population hates your democracy right now. Despite these challenges, West believes that technology will ultimately have a positive influence on democracy. Uh, you know, I, I think there is hope in some of these new approaches, these new systems, this new technology. It has to be used right. It's just a tool. But, you know, the, that does give me some hope for the future. I'm Kira Wright, reporting for Kojo 2020. With so many people on social media, especially during the pandemic, connecting with others virtually has become more and more important. Debate has renewed about how young people can navigate this space safely. Sean Mortel and Kayla Barker investigate. Yeah, it's like a double-edged sword. As good as it is, it's also bad. And You know, you have those days where you kind of catch yourself scrolling and then an hour later you're in a mood and you don't know why. Well, I was constantly comparing myself to others. Like, you'd see the more popular kids, because the more likes and follows you had, the more popular you were. Like, it just made me think, if I haven't got any worth, then what's the point of me even being here? It just creates a comparison trap, and that definitely is intensified now that there is social media there. I think the comparison is one of the biggest issues. I started sharing what I had gone through and how I got better. And in doing so, I had people from, from uni and my old high school reach out. And like, I thought, like, I don't know how many other people, especially during this time, are uh, dealing with things that I've had to deal with. So I've thought, why not just, you know, why not just share it with the world? <laughs> conscious social media use. So for me, what that means is becoming hyper aware of how you use social media. Just be as open-minded as you possibly can. Just completely just, uh, just don't even think about judgment because it does not matter. It does not matter what people think of you. It matters what you think of you. That report was from Sean Mortel and Kayla Baker. 
Throughout Melbourne's lockdown, many supermarket workers have dealt with abuse of customers and packed stores. But the pressure doesn't fall away when their shifts end. Mariah Papadopoulos reports. After a long day at work, James Halley arrives home with a different bizarre story every day. He was fresh out of year 12 and had just gotten a job at a local supermarket when the pandemic broke out. Yeah, so right at the start of the lockdown is basically when I started, yeah. With bouts of panic buying in March and April came abuse and insults directed at supermarket workers. Yeah, it's a Stop. Call the police. I'm calling the police. There's been some interesting customers. Someone did come in and steal five boxes of tissues because they weren't happy with the limits. But for James, the most serious risk was that of contracting COVID-19 at work and bringing it home to his family. It's always at the forefront of your mind what happens if. Big case numbers started coming in and that's kind of when it was most concerning, I think, because no one was really wearing masks and everyone was a bit complacent. When someone coughs, talks or breathes, they can release up to 300,000 liquid particles from their mouth. The risk of exposure to respiratory droplets that contain the coronavirus is heightened in busy public places like supermarkets, which have high volumes of people coming in and out. Australian grocery sales normally peak around Christmas time, but Nielsen reported an 18% jump between December last year and March this year. Supermarket workers have to deal with all of that panic buying also while contending with the challenges of life outside of work. Working at the supermarket has enabled James to support himself while making the transition from school to university, but it hasn't been easy. Yeah, I'm doing Bachelor of Global Studies and then I'm looking to add law onto that next year. I guess some of the challenges I've faced is definitely making new friends. It's just really hard to connect with different people and get to know them when you're talking to them through a screen. With universities across Melbourne operating remotely, thousands of students have struggled to do justice to their studies. James is just one of many young people supporting themselves by working in high-risk jobs, but he says he would do it all again. After all this is over, I definitely will continue working at RJ. It's been an interesting experience working in corona time, but it's definitely been really rewarding. Mariah Papadopoulos for Kojo 2020. <laughs>
I'm Arjun Bogle, reporting for Kojo 2020. We're just heading to a short break. Remember, you can follow us on Twitter at Junction Journos and Instagram at Junction Journalism. After the break, we'll be joined by three special guests as we dive into the Kojo 2020 debate. It's our final show, and the debate is the chance for us to round out our three days of live broadcasts and ask, what are the pros and cons of constructive journalism? Don't go anywhere. Hello and welcome to the Kojo Debate. I'm Dom Hennequin. And I'm Danielle Collis. And today we'll be debating constructive journalism. What is it? Do we need it? And is it a viable model in today's changing news landscape? We have an incredible panel joining us today, three international journalists with a range of experiences and views on constructive journalism. First, I'd like to welcome the founder and CEO of the Constructive Institute Denmark, Jurik Hagerop. Jurik was previously Executive Director of News at Denmark's Public Broadcaster and Supervising Producer of the World Program on the ABC News Channel. Uh, That's Girish Sol Solani there. Welcome to you all. Um, now. Before we begin, Danny, I don't know about you, but at the beginning of this week, I didn't really know all that much about constructive journalism. Oh, I know, Dom. I was exactly the same. I remember listening to your talk a few weeks ago about constructive journalism, and I found myself Googling constructive journalism. And then I had to look back over my own articles to make sure I was writing constructive journalism pieces. So before we get into it, I've come across this great grab from TEDx talk about constructive journalism. 
And you might ask yourself, why? Why is it that, that media companies do this? And the answer is usually, when I ask, it's to portray the world more accurately, to stop only focusing on the disease model of the world and report on the flourishing model of the world or just progress because that's valuable information for society to act on. Yurik, welcome. It's great to have you here. Could you tell us a bit about what constructive journalism actually is? How long has it been around? And is there a solution to every story? Let's take the, the last question first. Uh, no. <laughs> This is not about being constructive in any, any, uh, any, any story. If there's a big bomb going off, uh, tearing down the Sydney Harbour Bridge, uh, killing thousands of people, uh, you might not be very constructive about it uh, right now because what the public need first is getting to know that it has happened, why and uh, where it was and uh, further figure out why did it happen. But then maybe on day three or four, you will start asking the questions in society. How do you, how do we avoid this happening again? And these focus, this focus on the future, asking the questions and trying to find the answers to the questions of now what and how. That's the essence of constructive journalism. It's it's a way of thinking about journalism. It's trying. It's trying to add uh, new angles to it, nuances, inspiration, and then facilitating a debate in society on now what and how. Great answer. Well, what do you think, Tom? Girish, I'll go to you. Look, you've reported on various countries around the world, and you were also a Canberra correspondent for the Australian Network for a time. How open do you think journalists here in Australia would be to the idea of constructive journalism? Uh, look, it's a really good question because, you know, to be honest with you, just like everyone else, I didn't quite um, understand what, I mean, they, they never heard of the concept of constructive journalism, but it does seem for a lot of people that I work with, including my team here, it's something that, it's something that we um, already think about. That, you know, when we when we do a story, when we cover a story, we look forward as what Ulrich was mentioning, where does the story go? What are the solutions? And of course, totally agree that that point that I had, uh, that Ulrich had was quite a valid one. When something is breaking, a news story is breaking, for instance, if there's a terrorist attack, where do we go from there? And we had a similar issue last night on our program when we covered, you know, this sort of um, anti-Macron sentiment across the Arab world about his comments with regards to radical Islam. The story was, you know, it was still happening. Protests are going on. What is the solution? I mean, you know, we are not politicians. And I think at that point, you could only bring, you could possibly talk about where, what the best solution is to achieve, uh, to, uh, I suppose, ameliorate the situation, uh, to calm it down on both sides of the story. So uh, this, these are things that I think it's almost coming up as second nature to us. Where do we go? And I think it's, it's a concept that I think should be spoken about more so that it, it does become second nature to journalists who are covering both domestic and international issues. And Andreas Hasono also joins us as well from Indonesia. Listen, you're covering things like the, just the very freedom of the press where you are. And I believe that you've really, uh, like uh, Girish as well, uh, have just heard about the idea of constructive journalism. When the very idea of journalism is kind of, you know, under threat in some countries, how, you know, appropriate or how much of a priority should something like constructive journalism be? I, I really don't know. I, can you, can you hear me? Yes, we yes, can. Yes, we can. Yeah, just it's a great answer. Honest, I, I don't know because again, this is my daughter. Uh, basically <laughs> what I'm thinking is always this, uh, this is an old book, The Elements of Journalism by Bill Coffetz, Tom Rosenthal. 
they basically argue that there are 10 elements in journalism. One is journalism first obligation is to the truth, to the truth, functional truth, of course. Its first priority is to citizen. Its essence is a discipline of verification. Its practitioners must maintain an independence from those they cover. It must serve as an independent monitor of power, etc. You you know you you are familiar with this book. Uh, I think uh, journalists should make these ten elements of journalism as the guideline in in servicing the the public. No? <clears throat> Guys, look, the pandemic has ravaged many newsrooms around the world. It's caused mass layoffs and a sharp hit in revenues, but it's also brought some people back to the news and back to journalism and traditional sources. Many news services have recorded sizable bumps in traffic and audience figures, and many people have rediscovered their trust in some traditional venues of news. Yet, according to a Reuters survey, only 46% of people say that they trust the news that they themselves consume. Um, you know, Ulrich, do you think that it's a surprise that during a pandemic, uh, people have kind of turned to the news but still aren't trusting it? And would they trust it more if it was constructive? Yeah, let me answer that. But could I ask the producers to take down the sound of their voices in my yeah, ear because the, the then I can hear the question. So then, then I can uh, then I can hear it better. Yes, I'm not surprised. Thanks, guys. We apologize. We should all learn from what's what's going on uh, and and uh, during the pandemic and ask ourselves the question: What is it actually that the audience wants from us? How come they turn to what they? seem to be trusted sources, legacy media. And they did it because suddenly we realized we need curated news, turning to people, meaning journalists and news organizations who really try to give a nuanced, balanced picture and not only telling of what's going on, but also pointing to ideas on, on the right way forward. What have other countries done? What can we do? Um, all these stories are basically constructive stories. And, and uh, what we have seen in Europe, at least, is uh, in, the, in the spring, a lot of people came back to legacy media, especially public service media. But then as it flattened out the curve, then people, uh, news organizations tried, started to behave the way they normally did, uh, looking for the hair in the soup stories, uh, conflict stories, trying to find the most dramatic thing in order to get the attention of people still. And people were getting sick and tired of it. Now we are coming back to a second wave of the pandemic and we'll most likely see a rise again. But what after the pandemic? Because there will be an after the pandemic. We should learn and not forget the role we have. And let me mm -hmm. talk about uh, the books of, on, on elements of journalism. I fully agree on all the principles. And it's exactly about telling. This right, the way you did normally in the which is which is the reason why this is so important, what you're doing. Then uh, we are not, it's not because we are lying. But if we constantly focus on people who are the most loud, the most rude, and most extreme, people will start to think that the extreme is normal. And it leads to a lot of people turning back on news. It leads to polarization of our societies, and it leads to populism. Mm -hmm. We need to tell the truth, give people the best obtainable version of the truth, not is what is generating most attention necessarily. And that's what's wrong. So. Constructive journalism, I understand people who have never heard about it before will instantly say, oh, this is about happy-go-lucky journalism or it's activism or it's just a North Korean version mm. of journalism where you hide the truth and paint the sky blue. Mm. It's nothing of the sort. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And just after the pandemic, what a time to think about. You're watching the Kojo debate and after a chaotic start, we'll be back with more in just a sec. <laughs> it's a debate about the emerging practice of constructive journalism with our panic, Yurik Hagarup.
uh, Gilish Sawali and Andreas Hasano. Don't forget to follow us at The Junction Journalism on Instagram and on Facebook, and you can join the conversation using the hashtag Junction Journals. Danny? Sorry about that, Dom. Um, just going back to what you mentioned, you know, you're right, the pandemic has restored trust, but I think it also gave media outlets the opportunity to put their news behind a paywall. In Australia, we saw many newspapers shut down, some ceased printing. They took the opportunity to pivot purely online. And I know from my short-lived experience, it came about, it, it was all about the analytics and what is the most viable business model. You know, I've seen articles with dramatic headlines have a high reach in comparison to constructive journalism articles. But the interesting thing was that constructive articles had a longer reading time and they were the most shared. But still at the end of the day, the newsroom would applaud those who had the highest reach. So Ulrich, how do newsrooms adopt a constructive journalism approach whilst remaining viable? Yeah, but you, you're absolutely right. I mean, in, in the digital age, in the newsrooms that you will be entering, hopefully, after your, your studies, you will find something that was not there when I was a newspaper reporter. It is dashboards with KPIs where every reporter is being measured on how many people click on it, how many people share it. And, and the, if, if, you, if you can't, and the key thing is here, which is important for, for everybody, if you can't measure what is important, then what you can't measure will become what is important. And the, the importance of journalism is not to get eyeballs. It is not reach. It's not how many people view it or how many people by accident push a button. It's about impact. It's about responsibility. It's about storytelling, telling people important stories in order for them to make better decisions in their own lives. It's about bridge building in society. It's about telling stories so people understand why, who are they, what about the other ones, and what's going on around them. That's our job, but how do you measure that? So, but you can measure how many people click. So we are using the wrong KPIs uh, for measuring quality journalism. And that's part of the problem. And that's the reason why constructive journalism mm -hmm. gives us a vocabulary to talk about quality in a different way than the, the amounts of click. The truth is, in the digital world, people don't read news stories about a falling tree in Indonesia to the end. They scan, they might see half of the headline or read the first two lines and then they're onto something else. With constructive journalism, stories about people who do something the rest of us might learn from, they actually these, read these stories to the end and they spend more time on it and they share them more on social media. It's not because people don't want to, to be informed about also dramatic events that it might affect their lives, because of course they do, and that's also a job of journalism. So we shouldn't make this a tyranny of the or, then either you tell people important stories or you are constructive. We, it, it's the same thing. We have to do both. Mm. That's a really good Look, point. We're fast running out of time here, unfortunately, but I guess we'll open this up to, um, to uh, Gilish and um, Andreas as a final kind of uh, answer. Look, many newsrooms continue to work off of long established news values. You know, we want timeliness, bad news, conflict, drama. Um, I guess, you know, Gilish, maybe you first and then Andreas um, can give us the perspective from Indonesia, but what kind of newsroom cultures, what change would, would need to happen and should happen to indulge um, something like more constructive journalism? Is there too much of a focus on the old news values and you know, now, as we just talked about, on the kind of performance of news rather than what matters? Let's start with you, Gilish. Yeah, just um, I'll, I'll keep it really short. So I think one of the strategies that we looked at in terms of covering uh, the big issues of our time, the pandemic, for instance, we have moved, shifted towards the focus on what the audience wants. And what the audience wants is what to hear what, uh, what people in similar uh, circumstances to them, to them are. So we, we are getting into the communities, we're getting onto Facebook, Twitter, asking people uh, you know, 
to get on board to get on board of what they think and then sort of mix them up with the experts because people want to know what real people think like people who live in the suburbs people who live in the inner city what what their opinions are so i think getting into the heart is really really important for us um and and that's we've got a project at the moment called being more relevant to australian so it's more audience uh focused and i think getting that and getting the mix right of getting as as Ulrich was saying getting the authoritative sources and framing that whole discussion in, in a manner that would then attract people back to the mainstream audience of course um, the experience we have had at the ABC as far as the pandemic was, was concerned that was quite similar to Denmark. We had a lot of people coming to us because we were curating what was coming out there, given uh, the, the whole, uh, the amount of hoaxes and fake news stories that are around about issues concerning the vaccine, for instance. And very quickly, Andreas, do you think that, uh, you know, constructive journalism is, is a nice to have in a country like yours? Very quickly. Uh, well, basically, the the problem is is not is not creating another name in this journalism that we are struggling right now. I mm -hmm. totally respect uh, what Ulrich is doing, of course, uh, criticizing the current the current status and also the challenges but what the media is facing especially in countries like indonesia is immense not only because of the internet pressure uh, the internet take away the the advertisement money uh, by you know google facebook and the others but also because of the television we are seeing newsroom the jakarta post tempo compass link of people we are seeing hundreds of journalists in the course of their work got the COVID-19 infection. So mm. in, a, in a time like this, maybe it is also a good time to start thinking that we need what Charles Lewis uh, of the Reuters Foundation, the founder of the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, as uh, saying that we need a new model, a new business model for journalism. The old business mm. model obviously is not is not well like what it used to be. We used to have so much money, uh, journalism. Now we mm. don't have that much money. According to him, there are three new models for journalism. One is uh, non-profit journalism. If you take a look at ProPublica in the US or mm. Mongabai in the US, Indonesia, Latin America, India, uh, mm. Mongabe is one of the most uh, the most startling uh, rise in in the world of journalism, quality journalism. So non-profit journalism is one answer. The other, according to Diana, please, uh, the other two, the second <laughs> is non uh, NGOs. There are many NGOs that have good reasons. In the past, mm -hmm. they organization like mine, Human Rights Watch, we issue press release and the media take it. Now NGOs can have their own website, uh, their own videos, mm -hmm. their own podcast, mm -hmm. their own report printed PDF on their website. So according yeah. to Charles Lewis, NGOs are organizations that can provide quality journalism yeah. as well. So of course we are seeing yeah. a lot of Tang, uh, NGOs, the Lowly Institute in Sydney, uh, this kind of organization can provide good journalism as well. Last but not the least, according to him, of course, paywall. <laughs> right. uh, like yep. it or not, it is a long debate, Basically. but people need to support journalism. This is one of the new mm. business models that Dallas Lewis has proposed. Yeah. I wish we had so much more time to talk about this, but unfortunately that wraps up the code Joe debate for 2020. Thank you so much to our guests, Yorick Hagarup, Girish Solani, and Andreas Hasono. And sorry for probably mispronouncing your names. And thank you for joining us. You're watching the Kojo 2020. We'll be back after this.
The final installment of Kojo 2020. Over three days, we've had the pleasure of bringing you stories from people making a difference around Australia and beyond. A massive thank you to the crew who've been sharing their technical skills behind the scenes to help us go live. And thank you to all our reporters for their efforts putting together these stories in such difficult times. Thanks also to the Judith Nielsen Institute, The Junction and the Constructive Institute for their generous support for the program. This program was hosted by RMIT and brought to life with the help of our wonderful crew. I'm Zoe Stinson. And I'm Gabriela Kaylisa Mampau. And this has been Kojo 2020, Making a Difference. Thanks for watching. <laughs>